and any swearing at the end. Um, so I'll hand over to um, Maria now. And um, do you want to take it away? And we can, I'm sure the latecomers can, uh, can figure out what's going on. Okay. Thank you very much, Roy. I, okay, I will go to start this before. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Maria Victoria Mar. For uh, who doesn't know me, I'll give just a brief introduction about myself. I'm Italian and I'm actually back to, to Italy now. And uh, I from, come from uh, the tunnel of Italy, from the Strait of Messina. Uh, I've been involved, I am a marine biologist, I've been uh, involved in different types of marine biology related work, for vol volunteering activities with WWF for sea turtle conservation, and I also did uh, some uh, work with divers in Italy. Um, and uh, also, it, um, I was, uh, I was, um, teaching the volunteers who were coming to for the sea turtles about the biodiversity down the underwater biodiversity down here i recently discovered a, pa a passion for science communication volunteering for uh, organizations like pint of science and uh, very very recently also i've, I've started doing some uh, uh, marine science communication uh, um, putting together art and science, in particular music, with the Irish Ocean Literacy Network and a uh, ukulele band in Galway. But in terms of research, I worked only on sponges and I started in Italy with my master's thesis. Uh, and then this brought me to Ireland, precisely in Galway, where I did my PhD. And also I had another position afterwards working on sponges and I will tell more about it later on. So we are here today to talk about sponges. I always like to start stressing uh, a point that I was amazed to, this, to realize how is still not known. I mean that sponges are actually animals, not plants in spite of their aspects. Sometimes they are, sorry, they are actually the most ancient animals um, and, and, and they, even though they, it, it's, it's hard to believe sometimes that they can be animals because of the, the how simple apparently they are. In fact, they are basically a bunch of cells. They, they, are, they don't have proper tissues. And um, as their names, their scientific name suggests that is porifera, that means uh, poor bears, they are basically a uh, uh, very functional filter. So the, the the cells in these animals are organized in a way that the the body uh, of sponges is uh, all presents a huge number of small openings called ossia, from which the water flow comes into the animal, and then here inside the animal the the the, the, the nutrients the the food basically is. Uh, filtered and then the water comes out of the sponge from a larger opening called osculum. Uh, in, in even, sorry, just a sec. In, uh, in spite of the, um, of these uh, very simple structures, sponges have, uh, are characterized by the presence of a very large number of different types as more than 30, I'll give now, um, in a few slides, a brief overview about the, the most particular of them. Um, first of all, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll talk about the guanosites. They are basically the motor, that, the, the engine that allows these flows inside the sponges. In fact, the guanosite uh, cells, you can see them uh, at the bottom right corner of this uh, uh, images, they uh, are characterized by uh, the presence of a flagellum that is, is surrounded by a collar of uh, these, uh, um, um, these um, how can I call them, uh, projection, projections called microvilli. And thanks to the movement of this flagella, the, the, water, the, the water flow inside the sponges is created. And these microvilli are the ones that um, act like filter 
keeping the the nutrients that comes inside the sponge body with the um, through the, the the water flow. And these are some transmission electron microscopy pictures of uh, quanocytes that I collected during my PhD. And uh, these are uh, some um, scanning electron microscopy pictures instead that shows, and these are from literature instead, that shows very well the, micro, the, the, the microvilli I was talking about that creates this sort of net that captures the, the food for these animals. Um, this, um, um, th this system, this aquiferous system uh, of sponges is, uh, has evolved from a very simple one that is called ASCON, in which basically, essentially, the inside of the sponge is, li uh, is lined uh, with these uh, guanocytes, but uh, with the more, uh, the, the more and more evolved sponges, these uh, guanocytes are basically located inside specific areas that are called guanocyte chambers, where this, the filtration of the water um, um, actually happens. And uh, it is, um, uh, this slide is just to say that, uh, it's just to show that anyway, not all the sponges uh, actually are filter feeders. Some of them, a very small number of them, are interesting enough, are carnivorous, and they actually, as, as you can see in these pictures, they actually prey on small animals like carnivorous plants, more or less. And uh, so these, uh, these are some very beautiful examples of deep, deep sponges that are carnivorous. Um, another important uh, cell type in sponges is represented by the, the skeleton producing cells. Here at the top of the, of the slide, I show, I show the two main, uh, the two types. One is on the left hand side is uh, called sclerocyte and, and is the type of cell that produces these structure, the structures that you see at the bottom that are called spigules and they are basically the equivalent of our bones in, in sponges, and they are very important to identify sponges, as we will see later on. This other uh, type cell on the right-hand side instead is co called spongocyte, and it's responsible for the production of these uh, fibers that you see at the bottom that are called spongin, and they represent another important element of the skeleton of this uh, of these animals in, in some cases like actually the, the whole skeleton of the sponge is made of sponging. Actually based on the classif uh, on the nature of the skeleton of the uh, of sponges is, is um, based the main classification of these um, animals they are the, the phylum uh, porifera is divided in four classes the, the you can see in these pictures the, the first one is the calcarea that is uh, uh, made of all the sponges uh, that the have a skeleton made, made of calcareous uh, spigules. The demo sponge is basically represent the biggest group of sponges. I, if I'm not wrong, it's more than 80% and um, it's made of sponges uh, with skeleton made of um, silica or in, uh, in, in uh, the case of the so-called horny sponges, uh, the skeleton is made only of sponging. The exactinellida, which are uh, deep sea sponges, the, their skeleton is also made of silica and it's uh, very particular because the, the spigules are basically fused um, among each other. And finally, the homoscleromorpha, that is uh, the newest class of uh, sponges to be, um, this, uh, to be um, basically um, classified and it's uh, made of a group of uh, encrusting sponges uh, and with the skeleton made still of uh, silica but uh, characterized sorry, of uh, very small spigules. And um, another uh, important cell type in sponges is represented by the porocytes. They are the equivalent of our skin cells. Basically the, the porocytes uh, made the external um, uh, lay the outer layers of sponges, not only actually the external, but also they um, they surround the, the channels in of the aquiferous systems of these animals. 
A particular type of cells in sponges is represented by the so-called cells with these conclusions. The name, the name comes from the fact that they, uh, as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, slide, they contain uh, uh, a number of, uh, vesic of vesicles called inclusions that can be big, small, they can occupy the whole uh, of, the cell, of the cytoplasm of the cell and the content is very different, it can be uh, pigments, lipids um, or particular compounds produced by the sponges or even or glycogen and, or, and also other compounds and uh, we'll um, I'll mention again these cells uh, later on. Uh, sponges also have uh, basically the equivalent of myocytes, in, in fact in spite, of, in spite of the fact that they are sessile organisms, uh, they are capable of uh, um, very slow movements as you can see in this, uh, in this, uh, in this, big, in this slide where uh, the, a part of the sponge basically is moving uh, from, the, from the main animal. Um, in terms of reproduction, uh, sponges basically have sexual reproduction as they are. So coanocytes can um, uh, transform themselves in uh, uh, spermatocytes and, uh, um, that, uh, and then they can fuse with oocytes giving origin to uh, the new organism. And um, uh, uh, the, most of sponges produce larvae of different types. Very rare, in fact, is the direct development and the larvae once released, can, uh, are, are, they can swim, uh, it depends on the species, they can uh, actually travel for very long distances or, or they can settle very, very soon. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's, the, that's the natant uh, phase uh, of the uh, life cycle for sponges. Um, sponges are um, uh, in, in, still in terms of uh, sexual re reproduction and they can uh, uh, they can have uh, uh, separate uh, sexes or so the, the same or organism can have uh, spermatocytes uh, spermatids, sorry, and uh, oocytes uh, uh, one um, one specimen can uh, change uh, sex um, during uh, the life and it the, depends on the species the fertilization can be internal or external Sponges are also capable of um, uh, asexual um, reproduction and uh, there are three main uh, ways for, for that. One is the fragmentation. You, can, you might sometimes dive in a cave and notice this uh, weird, um, um, I cannot say, um, uh, hanging uh, body <laughs> coming from a sponge. That, it's actually a part uh, of sponge that can fall on the on the substratum and create another uh, organisms like um, a child basically from the from the main sponge. Uh, otherwise, other types of uh, asexual reproduction are represented by the budding that not that similar from the fragmentation we've seen before. It's like the reaction of these small um, structures. Uh, with the same, exactly with the same uh, genetic um, um, uh, material of the mother sponge, let's say, and each one can create a, a twin, basically, sponge. And uh, finally, gemmules, there are a specific type of reproductive uh, material that is created mainly from French freshwater sponges only rarely from marine sponges. They are created in when uh, the conditions become really harsh for the sponge uh, and uh, they are characterized by the presence of a very thick uh, layer that protects these uh, gems from the harsh conditions and when, sorry again, and when finally the, this, the, the situation improves for the sponge, each gem can give origin to a new sponge. This complex slide is just to show shortly that sponges in terms of reproduction are capable of adapting very easily to the condition um, they, 
they live in basically in, in order to obtain the best result in terms of uh, reproduction and actually plasticity it's um, it's uh, and a very important aspect of sponges that uh, shows itself also in other uh, in other aspects for instance um, this is uh, one uh, uh, sponge that I studied during my PhD Aliclona similans and uh, it, you see two very different uh, specimens but it's actually the same again sorry <laughs> it's actually the same species but present in very different conditions. In fact, the one on the left is from, uh, um, from uh, 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 actually no, sorry, the picture is from uh, um, a, a website that I'll tell later on, but it's, you can find this uh, morphotype in Albuy, for instance, where the, um, as far as I know, Tony and uh, Rory, please correct me if I'm wrong. The, the, there isn't a, a very strong water movement, as instead in this other picture on the uh, uh, this other picture that is, was taken during my PhD in Strength for Lock, where instead the, the water movement is uh, really really strong, so the sponge uh, is not able to develop these uh, um, these large branches. Uh, this plasticity can actually appear in the same individual at different times uh, based on the condition, the environmental conditions of the moment. Um, and also actually it can, it can happen in the same specimen uh, at the exact uh, same time. Um, this is an example of uh, um, a Mediterranean species that I studied for my master's thesis that is called Crumbe Crumbe. The, the plasticity here comes from the fact that basically this sponge produces uh, different, different spigules based on the different amount of silica in the water. Uh, these, uh, uh, these spigules that you see on the uh, left uh, side of the slide are the ones that are present all over the, uh, the, in, the, in, the, in the specimens of Crumbe Grambe all over the Mediterranean. But in, uh, in, 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 in the, I studied these sponges in the north of Italy in general, but in the south of Italy, where I come from, this is the actually, uh, these are all the types of spigules that you can find in Crumbe Crumb, it's because here there is much more silica than in the, in the north, uh, western north Mediterranean. Um, sponges, are, um, in terms of distribution, they, uh, they are, uh, present basically everywhere. There are more than 8,000... Giulia, <laughs> Sorry, guys. As I said, sorry, I apologize in advance. So, uh, sponges are, are present in uh, all possible environments. In from fresh water to um, uh, and to to basically the caves, uh, shallow waters, very deep waters, and uh, sorry, <laughs> and uh, um, and actually, it's been uh, recently discovered that sponges represent a very important component of the uh, deep sea floors. Uh, also, we, as we know, they are also very important in uh, a very big component of coral reefs, and they are even becoming more and more a larger component of these environments now that the, the corals are uh, being affected by climate change. Um, sponges, uh, sorry, just a second. <laughs> So, uh, sponges play um, uh, many important ecological roles in the, in the main environment I'm going to focus now. Uh, they represent a source of food for uh, a big number of, uh, of animals. They, um, with their, um, with their, um, um, just, sorry, just a second. 
I'm really sorry. Um, due to the uh, filter feeding um, uh, uh, nature, basically they represent an important uh, benthic pelagic coupling because they basically, uh, bring with their filter feeding activity, bring the nutrients from the from the from the sea surface, let's say, to the, the sea floor. Also, thanks to their uh, filter feeding activity, they uh, help control the eutrophication phenomena and represent, as we said, uh, most of sponges have a, a skeleton made of, of silica, so that they represent a very important stock in store for silica, that is one of the major nutrients in the marine environment, and also they represent um, a good shelter for a number of uh, many other uh, invertebrates, as you can see here. Um, also, uh, another important characteristic of sponges that is probably more of interest for us human beings is that they produce uh, some bioactive compounds that help them basically protect themselves. In fact, uh, I, I, I haven't said this, but sponges basically don't have physical ways to defend, defend themselves. So, uh, similarly to what plants do, they basically produce compounds with uh, toxic properties to uh, help them protect themselves. It's been, in the last decades, it's been discovered that these compounds have, uh, m many of these compounds have actually very interesting pharmacological applications. For instance, you see in this slide, two sponge species, um, um, te Tectycrypt, uh, I, I don't remember the name, right now, but basically the, um, these are the sponges from which the first uh, uh, compounds with anti-cancer, anti-tumor properties were isolated from, from sponges. Um, what is actually producing the compounds, the, the way these compounds are produced in sponges was actually the, um, the topic of my PhD in Galway and um, the, in fact uh, many sponges host in their tissues a number of um, uh, micro, 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 microorganisms uh, that establish um, uh, symbiosis with sponges and uh, it's still not known in, known in many cases who, who between, who, who, between the sponge and uh, the microbial symbionts who is the actual responsible of the production of these bioactive compounds. These microorganisms are very uh, diversified from bacteria to cy cyanobacteria, so microalgae and fungi as well. And in some cases, they represent up to 35% of the sponge biomass. Um, so so the, 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 the production of bioactive compounds is of big interest for us because as I said, uh, these uh, um, toxic compounds produced by sponges uh, can have uh, pharmacological applications from anti-tumor, but also anti-inflammatory, anti-malaria, for instance, antiviral, uh, and many others. So this is a very big uh, uh, reason for human interest in, in sponges. But much longer before these um, sponges were well known for their because uh, of the um, because they were used as tools to clean ourselves for our hygiene, but also they were used for other applications, like for instance for painting. And uh, so, because sponges have been uh, for so long so important for us, they've been um, largely exploited, largely fished uh, in some areas of the world, and this has brought to the, um, um, the, the of uh, some sponge populations and as consequence of that uh, the farming of sponges has become very important. That was actually my work when uh, I did my master's thesis. I was uh, um, uh, farming the sponge I mentioned, Crumbe Crumbe, because it's, a, it's an interesting sponge. It produces very, very, very toxic compounds and uh, um, uh, um, the in situ farming, there is the, 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 the farming on sponges in, uh, in the sea. It's only one of the, the possible ways to produce uh, sponge biomass. Other possibilities are 
uh, farming sponges in aquaria, cell cultures or um, the cultivation of sponge cell aggregates called primates. So now this was uh, uh, an introduction to the sponge in general. Now I want to focus more on the identification of these uh, animals. That is uh, the reason why we are here today, because um, as the, the guys of Caesar Sharland have said clearly, sponges are among the, the groups that are uh, uh, of less, let's say, uh, uh, they represent one of the least, let's say, focuses of um, uh, of identification from the, the divers. Um, I'm, as I mentioned before, uh, spigots that, as I said, represent like the equivalent of our bonds in sponges, represent a very important uh, element to be able to identify these uh, animals. In fact, uh, spigots are present in very different uh, shapes and sizes and uh, also in combination uh, among them. Uh, spigots are mainly divided in two groups based on their size. The uh, microsclers, they are the ones on the, on the left hand side, and the microsclers instead, uh, that are um, the one, the, 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 um, uh, so sorry, the, the, the microsclers rep, uh, constitutes the main skeleton of the sponge, the microsclers. Um, it's, it's there to support the the, the microsclera, microsclera, sorry, in most of cases. Um, as yes, I was saying, there are many different shapes of spigots, and even uh, considering one uh, one shape at a time, uh, there are uh, additional elements that can help to identify different types of species and so different species like for instance you see this sort of uh, banded needle sh shaped spigot that is called oxia on the right hand side you can see that it can uh, the, it can be more or less straight that can be more element uh, in different parts of the of the of the length of the ox and even the tips the ends of the of the, the spigot can have very different shapes. So these are all elements that need to be considered when looking at spigots. Another important uh, ele element to consider to be able to uh, identify to, to di differentiate different uh, sponge species is the way the, the, the spigots are arranged in the, to form the skeleton. And uh, these are some some example, and uh, you can see also um, how the, the small the microsclers are present sometimes to, um, to uh, as a, uh, support to the, the microsclers. Um, so uh, the identification of different sponge species based on their skeleton has been. Uh, the, 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 the way to uh, identify these animals for a very long time and that the, the, the base of the history of sponge taxonomy is based on that. But uh, with time it has become more and more evident that some species are, it's, it's not enough for some species to use the skeleton to differentiate them. So uh, in the last decades uh, the molecular identification has become very important as well. And um, uh, the sponges, so no, basically, um, this is uh, the sponges I studied for my PhD are, are a fantastic example of that. In fact, th these uh, species all, uh, are all cl at the moment classified in the genus Aliglona, which um, is uh, uh, basically made of, uh, uh, of sponges who, who all present these. Uh, uh, spigot type I mentioned before, the oxia, and uh, um, they may or not have other types of uh, spigots, but the oxias are definitely the main type of uh, spigot in this uh, in this species. So the classification has been made based on the morphological um, external uh, characteristic of these sponges as well as the size and the shape of these oxias. And uh, when the molecular uh, analysis of, has, has been introduced, it has become more evident, more and more evident that the classification of these organisms has to be revised because um, it's, um, 
is uh, not uh, uh, it's not really true. Um, this uh, I'm giving some example now. These are two uh, sponges you might know. One I mentioned before that is Aliclona similans. The one at the bottom, the other one is Aliclona cumulata. Uh, they are um, considered uh, very close to each other uh, in terms of uh, uh, classification based on the skeleton, but it's actually not true uh, based on the molecular study and. Uh, it's, uh, it's necessary to look at very different parts of the body of these, um, of these animals to be able to see the differences in the skeletons as well. In fact, you see at the, the, uh, on the left hand side, the picture at the top is uh, uh, the skeleton of the, the, the tip of the branches of the Alicrona culata that is very different from the skeleton of Similans uh, at the bottom. Uh, these, uh, uh, these ones instead are Aliclona mediterranea and Aliclona cinerea. They have very similar skeleton, so uh, to be able to um, distinguish these two um, species is necessary to consider uh, the environment th they come from because the Mediterranean is not present here in Ireland. So to find a sponge with this, uh, part with this um, um, uh, morphology and this type of, of spigule in Ireland would bring to uh, identify it as scenery and not as me, uh, Mediterranean. These are, are now uh, viscosa that uh, from, I, I, from the top to the bottom uh, the sponges are Aliclona viscosa and distincta and sarai. Uh, for sa the you see the pictures of their skeleton is basically impossible to distinguish them but again, with Sarai, it's a species from the Mediterranean, it's not present here. The other two instead, the viscose and indistinta, can create really a lot of confusion because, as you can see in these pictures, they can really clear like each other. But um, it's at least, again, the environmental component helps because, as far as I know, indistinta is not a subtitle. Um, um, species, so you can't see in this tinta if you go diving, you can see it if you go walk along the shore when uh, there is low tide, whereas instead uh, viscosa it's, uh, can be found uh, underwater. And other elements can be considered to um, distinguish very difficult uh, to classify sponges like my aliglona, and uh, this is uh, the consideration of all these other aspects, it's, all, it's what it's called integrative taxonomy. What are these aspects? Um, if, you see, if you divide this uh, picture in two sections, the one at the top represents uh, cells with inclusions. If you remember, I mentioned these uh, particular cell types earlier on, uh, these are cells full of these uh, uh, inclusions of different natures, and uh, the same type of cell with inclusions is present in Aniclona viscosa and distinct and sarai that we saw in the previous slide. And, uh, and this proof like they are very closely related. Whereas the, the, pic, the, the pictures at the, the bottom of these slides represent the um, microsymbionts that live inside the, the, tish, the, the, the body of these sponges. And they are very different. These micro, the microbial associations for these three sponges are very different. So, you see in this slide two elements that um, can help classify in different sponges. Another one is represented by the type of uh, chemical compounds they produce. Um, and um, so basically, um, this is uh, how the way our sponges uh, can be identified. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, I, I would like to I actually put in, uh, in the chat um, uh, the link to a video that I will uh, really uh, strongly recommend you to watch, that is how to prepare spigots. And if you watch it, you might realize that it would even be possible to, to obtain uh, spigots in your, in your own home. If you were able to put your hands on the microscope, you would actually do your own sponge identification. In fact, to obtain the spigule is pretty easy. It's, uh, uh, here I describe more the lab way, uh, but you, you can do it yourself, really putting a piece of sponge in a container and adding 
some uh, uh, surgery my eyebrow, some bleach, sorry, and do repeat it for a couple of times. Eventually, you get pretty clean spigots that if you put them on a, on a slide, you will be able to observe the spigots on the, on the microscope. Also, to be able to, um, it would be even possible to obtain um, sections of the sponges that can be useful to observe the arrangement of the skeleton using a, a club oil that uh, you can find in Evergreen, for instance. Just put in these uh, uh, very the thinnest possible sections of uh, dried or uh, uh, preserved in ethanol sponge tissues that you can obtain. The club oil is good to clarify basically the, the, the tissue and uh, it's possible to observe the arrangement of the spigots in the, in the skeleton. And these here are some uh, of, the, uh, of the material we have, uh, spongeologists have uh, to, to help themselves identify the sponges. The system of is basically the Bible of uh, for sponge taxonomists, and then there are many papers that have been published describing the sponge species or, or the, uh, and the uh, spigule and skeleton arrangements. And so actually in the chat you can find the, the link to this thesaurus of sponge morphology that describes, uh, gives you a, a very good description of the different types of spigules and uh, skeleton arrangements and other important information about how to identify sponges. So, um, the, with uh, Sea Search Island uh, has uh, proposed this very interesting, in my opinion, project that is uh, called indeed Sponge Project. Uh, the idea is to collect uh, from uh, whoever wants to uh, be involved when you guys go diving and you see some sponge of interest or for you or, or some sponges that you will, you have no idea what it could be and you would like to, to, to get to know about it, you will consider to collect a sample and send it to the guys, those to Rory and Tony um, with the idea in the future to have someone helping to identify them. To do that, it's the, the, the best way to do this is, first of all, to take a, a clear picture of the sponge in situ because that it's really helpful for identification. Then collect all the possible details you can about the sponges that I'm, go, I'm going to describe now. And then the, the samples should be preserved in absolute ethanol because, um, as I said, uh, sometimes the molecular identification is, uh, is necessary and uh, the best way to preserve the DNA is to preserve the sponges in absolute ethanol. So uh, when I said a clear picture, what, what did I mean? These are examples of uh, clear pictures because um, the, everything that, can, everything that uh, we can observe of the sponge can be helpful to identify it. So there are so many um, elem so many details, sorry, that it wouldn't be possible to see anymore once the sponge is collected, like for instance, the channels or the shape of the, the oscules. So it's very important to take a clear picture underwater. Then I was saying it's very important to write down all the possible details or encrusting and massive forms. Um, we can go into details, for instance, for the encrusting and massive, we can consider more encrusting can be in thin encrusting or thick encrusting. The massive sponges can, uh, can, be, can have uh, a globular um, shape and with or without a stock. And as regards to the encrusting sponges, we said thin and, and thick, but there are even more um, characteristics to consider. For instance, the presence of pores or the presence of projections or probably, or if, if this, the, the surface of the sponge is spiky or smooth, 
if the, can the canals, the excurrent canals of the sponges can be clearly seen underwater. Other uh, evident features, as in these pictures you see here, that is uh, um, one Alexona species, and you can see really clearly the, the skeleton arrangement uh, in it. Um, another important element to consider is the color that uh, in most cases is affected once the, the sponges are out of the water and even more uh, in most of cases it's, it's lost when the sponges are put in um, edano. It's a very, color can be very important in some cases because it's really characteristic of certain species um, like the ones on, on the bottom, the black tar sponge that is black or uh, um, Kelanoclisilla something that is purple or Terpius gelatinosus here that is uh, blue, uh, strongly blue and it's interesting actually because the color is uh, due to the, 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 the microsymbionts in it. Here instead, uh, these are different species of, uh, sorry, uh, I, I say the, the pronunciation in Latin, I'm not sure how it is in English, uh, Imedesmia. Um, this, this species, Imedesmia, Imedesmia paupertas, again, sorry, don't know the English pronunciation, it's this uh, light blue color, and uh, these are other two um, species in the same genus, and they are characterized by these, uh, these other colors. So, it's even though the, the, sh the shape of these, uh, these, these sponges is very similar, the color helps to identify them. There are still other features to consider that can really make a huge difference. One is the production of slime, that it's really, for uh, one of the species I studied during my PhD was really famous <laughs> because it's Aliclona cinerea because it's, it looks similar to other sponges uh, you can find in the same environment, but the main difference, the difference between this sponge and the other sponges is the production that Alicrona cinerea produces these strands of slime, like in the pictures you see here. And other uh, important characteristics are the, the surface, as I was saying also before, if it's smooth or it's uh, rough or spiky or whatever else, the consistency, because um, the two sponges may look very similar, like uh, Aliclona similans and Ogulata, but similans it's so, it really if you touch it, it's so hard it, as uh, a wooden stick, as instead uh, Ogulata is much more elastic, so the consistency can say a lot as well. And then uh, other characteristics are uh, the shapes of the osculs, the smell, that's, um, I can say that's really true, I experienced that myself when I was working on sponges here in Italy, because I remember I was uh, working every time uh, this uh, Ircinia species, Ircinia in English, I guess, was collected, I could uh, recognize it from the smell. And, uh, and finally, the habitat, because as I mentioned earlier on, uh, this, the, the picture there is another uh, um, Aliclona, al Aliclona indistincta um, sample. That, uh, as I was saying, uh, this species is uh, an intertidal species, so that helps to distinguish it from uh, viscosa. Um, if you guys consider to take part to the sponge project, uh, here I show ideally what would be uh, the size of a sample to collect. Of course, this is a massive sponge, so that's easy to say. For encrusting sponge, sponges, as I, I know very well, working on crumble grumble, it can be very challenging to collect a decent uh, side sample. Um, and now to conclude this uh, journey on, on sponges, I want to blow your mind showing uh, all the different, uh, not all, basically um, the sponges uh, present in Ireland, there are, uh, um, sorry, just check if I uh, I can't see the chat now, but yeah, I think I, I added this um, this website on uh, on the chat. It's uh, the sponge guide created by Bernard Picton, Christine Morrow, that is available online. So I to to show you the the sponge species, I will um, divide them in the groups I showed earlier on based on their forms, like branching, uh, fan, uh, encrusting, and blah blah blah. 
So these are, uh, I start with the branching sponges. Uh, you, can, uh, um, you can consider several aspects like uh, if there is a dichotomy, uh, if the, the branches are long, if they are uh, simple, if they are uh, um, complicated, uh, um, have complicated ramification. And uh, on, this, um, on this slide, I want to uh, show in particular Raspelia ramosa, which is, uh, can be recognized by this uh, um, particular color that is in between brown and red, basically. And from the surface, that is a very hispy because of the, the, the presence of many speakers. And it's the reason why this sponge sometimes looks gray, because it's actually covered in, uh, in sediment. These are other examples of uh, branching, uh, branching sponges um, found in Ireland. Um, here you can see that the branches are very different, it can be very different in shapes and more or less complicated. And uh, Seligera suposa is another uh, interesting, uh, um, it's, uh, in, in another, an interesting sponge for the reasons I was saying before, that it's always important to consider other elements because the linger suppose produces a, a very copious amount of slime. So this could be an important element to distinguish the linger from other branching sponges. And here again, my um, beloved uh, Aliclona grulata and similans. Um, the, now the cup, or base or fun uh, shaped sponges. Several species of Axinella uh, present in, uh, in, in Ireland uh, fall into this, uh, this category. Um, you can see Flustra or Flustra, for instance, as a very clear fun uh, shape. And uh, these are um, examples of cup. Um, shaped sponges um, uh, and the uh, Aliclon of Cheus is another one that I actually uh, met during my PhD and this is uh, also part it's, uh, it's not only the shape that it's so particular that helps identify it but also the the size because gen geez, <laughs> generally this, uh, this sponge is pretty small Tubular um, sponges, uh, one pretty, pretty, pretty well known is uh, Saigon Siliatum, that is uh, this sponge with this uh, 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 sort of pineapple, elongated pineapple uh, slash sausage shape, it's a calcarea and um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a very nice sponge and it's, the shape is really Characteristic, so it's difficult to uh, confuse it with other species. Grancia compressa, it's, um, it's uh, another calcarea, and uh, as the name said, uh, it's characterized by this compressed on the side um, shape. Sorry, I see something on the chat. Oh, okay, sorry, I thought it was a question. And uh, thank you very much, by the way. And other calcarea here, um, uh, uh, Sycandra utriculus and uh, Leuconia gemstoni um, are again, they have a tubular shape similar to Cyclum, but it's uh, really not as regular as it is in that sponge. So definitely that sponge is uh, much easier to identify. Cladrina coriacea and uh, Cladrina clatrus, the with the laces, the lace sponges, uh, they look very similar to each other, but actually it's possible to distinguish them because Clatrina clatrus is always yellow and the, the tubes are bigger in it, white Clatrina coriacea is, is usually white as the common name says, but it's, it can be of other colors as well. Um, these are examples of sponges that I would find it possible to distinguish underwater, so definitely samples for, uh, for spigular uh, preparation. Now another, uh, let's see some globular sponges. Um, Clatrina lagunosa is another calcarea. It could be um, easily uh, confused with 
Quasilina brevis that is completely unrelated, but as, as you can see underwater, the shape might be not that different. So Brevis carnosus is quite common, and um, it's even though. Uh, get because they are the um, yeah so it's um, it would be also good to uh, collect samples of superitis to be completely sure about the identification but you can anyway you can see one characteristic of these sponges is this uh, big osculum that at least uh, brings us to say it's a superitis when you see this type of sponges the golf ball sponge tetia citrina it's uh, another one that is very uh, typical with these uh, 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 sort of spikes and is a big osculum and looks like a, a, a tennis ball with the yellow color. There are other two species in the same genus that look very similar to, to the golf ball sponge, but um, they can be, they, first of all, they are, they are uh, uh, less common and uh, usually they, they never get to the same size as uh, Tetia citrina. Um, Cronella cranium and Zetlandiga uh, also have this uh, nice ball shape, but it's, uh, it's uh, difficult to, that they can be confused with Tetia because of the color that is uh, quite, uh, tip, quite characteristic for Tetia, but also these uh, Craniella species tend to be more. Uh, uh, deeper than uh, than Tedia that can be found even in the intertidal environment. When before we went, we mentioned the encrusting and the massive, the encrusting are probably the most uh, entertaining in terms of difficulty to distinguish them underwater. As you will see now, you will see like slides and slides of sponges that look like each other. Basically, before I show the ones that could be. Uh, identified uh, pretty easily underwater. Oscarella, even though has this diff can, can have different color mor morphotypes, has this uh, very velvety surface and uh, this uh, low borous um, surface that makes it quite uh, easy to distinguish compared to other species. And then, as I said before, ter Terpis gelatinosus and Kelona pisillanemus have these very characteristic colors. So, uh, it helps to identify the sponges. Again, uh, the black tar sponge is also pretty easy to uh, distinguish. It's like this black sheet on, uh, on the substratum and uh, the Exadella racovizzae uh, can have different morphotype, uh, sorry, uh, co um, color morphs, but um, again, it's, uh, it's quite uh, it has a quite dis disting distinguished face, let's say. Now I said I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna show you several species that are pretty difficult to distinguish because there isn't uh, a real uh, um, element that, that underwater allows to identify them particularly. Um, you see uh, the color in this slide, for instance, I show these two species for which the color doesn't, doesn't mean anything because uh, the same species can uh, appear in different colors and uh, you see the, there are similar elements like the excurrent canals are very evident in both cases. The, the surface seems to be pretty similar as well. These are examples of uh, really, uh, I'd say almost impossible sponges to sample for even to, to try to to identify them probably it would be a good idea if possible to sample the the, the substratum they are uh, they live on um, and, and now yeah other examples of uh, encrusting sponges very difficult to distinguish underwater um, uh, yeah sorry I, I, this is uh, uh, for uh, uh, Euripon Coronla, I couldn't find uh, the, the sponge, so I put uh, a picture of the, the speaker. Aliclona uh, fibulata was the one uh, I mentioned before, and it's, it, it's possible to distinguish compared to other um, 
uh, encrusting sponges because you can see uh, in transparency the, the arrangement of the skeleton and that is actually pretty characteristic in uh, aliclona species. So at least this, is, this could be easier to identify compared to other species. Aliclemia verticillata, uh, definitely not underwater, but it has a very, very characteristic uh, species that actually give the name to the, to the species that help uh, identify it more easily. Here again, other examples of difficult encrusting uh, um, sponges. Here, with these two species, I um, um, I, I, can, um, I can give another other two examples of how other elements can be taken in consideration to be able to identify sponges. In these two cases, is the uh, symbio I don't know if I can say symbiosis easily, but that's the relationship that these sponges have with other animals. For instance, um, so I, I can't read this bit. Uh, so the first mycal uh, at the top is uh, tends to, to, to grow on uh, the shells of uh, specific um, uh, shells, so uh, bival bivalves. So this could be a way to help identify the species. As for Maxilla ancorata, it tends to grow on embryozoans, and again, this uh, association can help identify the species. Here, uh, back to uh, difficult uh, species to identify underwater. And uh, that was it. Now, uh, the, the spiky encrusting sponges, uh, that, um, basically the characteristic of these sponges is that they have this spiky uh, surface that is uh, due to the presence of bundles of spicules that basically stick from the from the surface or it's because of the sponging filaments that again um, emerge from the surface of the sponge. The most uh, common here is probably um, Nicidia fragilis that is uh, um, actually very, very easy to find both underwater and in the intertidal environment and uh, it is in my opinion to, opinion to distinguish from uh, Dicidia palescens because the second one um, tends to have usually this uh, white, oh, sorry, this pink color, whereas instead Dicidia fragilis is more whitish, grayish. So the color is quite good in this case to distinguish the two species. Again, uh, with the Diablisilla species, uh, uh, we, they have these very characteristic and different colors. More difficult probably to identify the Vienna var variantia and Ulosa digitata. Uh, as regards now the massive thickly encrusting sponges, um, here uh, some examples again where the colors help help a lot to distinguish the species, like we have this very white uh, calcarea or this bright yellow spongosorite calcicola or this red raspaciona aguleata. Here, uh, two uh, other two common sponges, uh, Alicondria panisia and Alicondria bowerbachi. That, uh, funny enough, in my experience, I think in Ireland it's pretty, uh, it's not that difficult to distinguish the two sponges. Also, the, I, because Alicondria panisia quite often has this uh, association with green microalgae that give life this green hue to the surface of the sponge, whereas in the Mediterranean, the two species really look much more similar to each other, and it's quite difficult to distinguish the two of them, and in fact, they have been, uh, I actually don't know if uh, it has been solved or not the problem, but, but they were proposed as sponges to study molecularly to to be able once and forever to distinguish the two species. Um, here now, again, my friends, the Aliclona uh, is on top uh, Aliclona Sineria, the one I was saying before that has the, produces the, uh, the slime, um, and viscosa and indistinct, we have talked already about that, but again, um, more, more pictures showing how similar they look to each other. 
um, my, my, my maxilla species. Some of them, like uh, incrustants and rosacea in this, uh, these pictures can be recognized because when they are basically torn apart, uh, uh, it release a huge amount of slime. Um, other species here that uh, I found, I would find myself difficult to distinguish uh, underwater. The only exception is the Maigale lingua because it does these very evident groups that help, are, are really unusual and uh, represent a very good element to distinguish this, uh, this sponge from other uh, species in the same genus. Here, the, the other two superiority species I was saying before, massa is actually quite dis, uh, dis distinct. Whereas instead, superiority ficus, in spite of the color that is like bright orange or even red, when the specimens are small, um, it could be some difficult sometimes to be sure that is a uh, ficus and not Carnosus, the one we, we saw before. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, spiegel prep, at least, it's always a uh, good help. Um, Pag uh, Pagimatisma Johnstonia is, uh, um, is, uh, an, is actually one of the most uh, easily identifiable sponges. It has a very characteristic shape. Um, um, the, the, organization, the um, arrangement of the osculus is, still, is quite characteristic to the color and uh, the surface uh, and it's a pretty common species as well. Uh, Geodia is, um, could be uh, characteristic too but it's a pretty deep species so it's, uh, it's quite uh, it's difficult to think uh, to, meet, to find it during a, during a, a regular dive. Thymosia gernae um, also is a, a pretty uh, characteristic with this white color and uh, the consistency is also another important element for these sponges that is quite uh, elastic and uh, firm. Here other uh, massive sponges um, that uh, encrusting sorry um, sponges that uh, will be more difficult to identify with certainty underwater. Um, and now, um, uh, the sponges with poor sieves. These are the most famous example, probably. I mean, I mean my Gallico Lumella, with this very uh, peculiar light pink color and uh, the big uh, oscula and uh, Cleona selada, the bird sponge, with again very uh, characteristic with its yellow color and these uh, numerous oscula. Um, uh, here, the, 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 the sponge I mentioned before, Imedesmia paupertas, the, the light blue sponge, that it's really easy to distinguish from the other species in the same genus because of the color, as I was saying before. But there are also other species in the same genus, like this panza and the, the other ones uh, to follow, that are more difficult to distinguish because the color is not very informative. And uh, um, as you can see uh, in the pictures of, on the right hand side, when the, 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 the of these sponges are closed, it's basically, it's really difficult to distinguish them from other encrusting sponges with similar um, can, uh, canals, um, pattern, um, underwater. Here are more uh, examples for us, there are several species into this genus and again, for some of them, as you can see, these ones with this very evident excurrent canals, it would be really hard to distinguish them from other uh, species from co completely unrelated. Um, now, sponges with uh, projections like Amphilectus fugorum, the shredded carrot sponge, is pretty common and uh, um, it, it has this very uh, characteristic orange or light red color. Um, other examples of sponges with these uh, projections like um, Aimeniacidum kitchingi is one that could be confused easily with Paniclona cinerea. Um, 
I mean, niacinum perlevis is a, is a very common sponge and it's a difficult one because it, it's really variable, this, uh, the morphology of this sponge, even the color. So sometimes it's hard to distinguish it from other uh, sponges. Or this uh, Hymeniacidon simplissima um, that um, doesn't look that different compared to other sponges like uh, Polymastia, uh, Boletiformis, that we'll see later on. And uh, another <clears throat> Aliclona here, Fistulosa, with these very, very long projections, typical of this species. Um, and uh, now massive worm cresting sponges with papilla, like the bol Polymastia Boletiformis, I was saying before, the hedgehog sponge, uh, which is really cute, <laughs> in my opinion. And um, other examples here, the chimney sponges, with this. Uh, um, um, <clears throat> oscula protruding from the substratum and uh, to, to give an example of how sponge taxonomy can be really uh, entertaining, you see the last sponge here, uh, you can barely see probably the oscula coming from the substratum, it's called Raspailia guleata here, but it's, it has been recently um, is, so the, is, um, it's it's um, Classification has been recently revised, I, I imagine based on the molecular studies, and now it's, uh, oh, ah, sorry, Jesus, I'm so sorry that I, it, it, it doesn't work. Well, it has been um, uh, redescribed as uh, Raspagiona guleada, that is a sponge we saw earlier on, that is a massive sponge, red in color, so how this is, this is possible based on morphology, I don't know, but uh, it's a, uh, based on molecular study, uh, yeah, a, a lot of sponges that before were considered totally unrelated are, are now considered actually uh, very closely related. <clears throat> so during the, the, the presentation of the, the species, I was, um, um, I was particularly stressing some of them because they are part, uh, part of another section of the sponge project that, of Search Island that is called Sponge Safari. So it's, uh, um, it's about the six, six species here showed again in this slide that are very easy to identify underwater. So it would be very useful for sea search if you guys next time you go diving and notice the presence of these sponges will record them or um, let Rory and Tony know about your um, uh, um, uh, dives and your uh, encounter with these species. Here are some uh, um, additional information about the sponges that 